Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Evans Life, A Remarkable Adventure. I'm Bob Evans with my beautiful wife, Diane. Say hello, dear. We are the parents of 18 children and are sharing what has become uh, our remarkable adventure. and, And we're sharing it with you in the hopes that you will be able to create a remarkable adventure Uh, for yourself, whatever that may look like. One of the challenges that families are facing in this day and age is the threat against our children over the internet. The combination of children and smartphones and other digital devices can be extremely dangerous when you add in social media and chat sites and that kind of thing. We've even had our own brush with that kind of thing involving one of our own children, and it was very, very frightening for us. The FBI estimates that 500,000 online predators, each with multiple online profiles, are trying to engage with our children every day. Crime statistics show that more than 50% of the victims are ages 12 to 15, and 89% of victims are contacted by online predators through chat rooms and instant messaging. The sexual exploitation of children and cyberbullying are very serious subjects that we felt needed some expert input. And so joining us today is Michelle Bush Upwall, an education specialist with the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force in the Utah Attorney General's Office. She has an extensive background in law enforcement, working with young people who have been victimized. Also with us is Sete Aulai, for who for the past six years has been a special agent with the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force at the Utah Attorney General's Office. He's also served as a West Valley City police officer where his assignments included patrol, SVU detective, SWAT operator, and field training officer. Both of you, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. We welcome you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. We're excited to you know, get some guidance and understanding from you guys. So thank you for your expertise, the time that you've taken to learn what you do to keep our families and children safe. Thank you. Now, we live in an online world anymore. How bad is the problem of child victimization on the Internet? Can you set the stage for us? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start it off. It is, it's a huge issue, and it is well and alive here in our, in our state of Utah. Uh, with, with the increase of internet speeds, not only here on the Wasatch Front, but also in rural Utah, um, we've, we've seen the numbers of reports, the number of cases increase uh, quite a bit uh, just, w- just within the past year. Um, we've, we, we've seen our cases increase, especially uh, during the COVID year last year, um, simply because people were home. And internet access is easy, internet speeds are faster. And so that just creates um, uh, um, an issue in regards to what we have to investigate, unfortunately. Elaborate just a little bit, if you would, say, hey, on how the internet speeds affect the number of cases. How, uh, tell us why that is. Well, I mean, we, we live in a world of, of, of instant gratification. When we choose to watch something, we want it to, to, to come through without any sort of buffering. And so uh, when, I, when I say that internet speeds are, are affecting these cases, that just means that um, when, when, when our children are, interf- are, 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 are video chatting with, with, with someone or, or taking a, a picture, um, and then they send it. Uh, that's getting out there fast because of the the, the increase of internet speeds. And um, l- like you said at the beginning, um, I've I've been in I've been in this line of work um, specific to ICAC uh, for the past six six and a half years. And just within that time frame alone, I've seen the increase in internet speeds and how that has affected these cases. Just because of how how fast these offenders want this kind of content and how fast um, children are 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 online and 
and them wanting to, them seeking that kind of attention. Wow. I mean, you know, I homeschooled seven of ours last year and we had to get iPads for everybody. The school provided Chromebooks, but those weren't fast enough. So everybody got an iPad. And I will tell you, let's just start here. We can start here. Um, one of my children that's very innocent, not necessarily a good reader, we're working on that. We'd all sit in the same room. I wouldn't let them take their iPads somewhere else. I've got chills talking about this. And she got herself an Instagram account. I didn't know it. But she's sitting six feet from me, you know, so she it's not like she's hiding away somewhere. And we opened up her iPad at the dinner table. And all of a sudden, my adult daughter that got caught in the pandemic at home goes, what? What in the world? It was Instagram messaging. And there was such horrific filth. I mean, we gathered her with Bob and myself um, that night when he got home from work and we sat down and we read it with her and he said, do you know what this means? And she said, no, he goes, well, you answered. She goes, oh, I had Siri read it to me. And she was answering things that she thought she was in a game, but it was so horrific. There were things that Bob wouldn't even speak to me about. And we actually contacted your office. I mean, the next step they had already said, are your parents nice to you? Or um, did something happen recently? And she goes, yeah, I got my ear hurt thinking she was a puppy, right? And he said, well, if your parents don't want to take care of you, I can take care of you. And then he went on to explain all the things. And I'm sure, and here's the horrific thing. I was getting ready to go out of town for three days for surgery in California. So she would have been at home without mommy, obviously not looking very carefully, but who knows? I mean, he could have said, he asked, do you like going to the malls? Do you like amusement parks? What is fun for you? I mean, I think in my heart and mind, he was preparing her to yeah, say, well, if mommy her, and yeah. daddy aren't going to take care of you, I can take care of you, you know, but it was such filth. And I would have thought Instagram, I mean, even though she wasn't supposed to have it, wouldn't have been that filthy of a place. Gosh, what do we do as moms and dads? I mean, you guys are on the front lines. How do we help? I guess is my best word. Protect the children. <laughs> yeah. I'm done, but <laughs> we need help. But I'm not the only one that's probably wondering, my goodness, if it's this bad, and a lot of them have a lot more iPads and computers than they ever did because of the in and out of school with COVID, what do we do? Um, so, you know, what you were describing is the grooming process. That is what these guys do to their victims. And it's exactly what you said. It's they're going to talk about, you know, I'll do this for you. They want to build that trust. They yeah. want to rapport with that victim. Um, and they tend to go after very vulnerable they'll find the most vulnerable spot that a child has and they're going to attach to that. And we, you know, you talk about Instagram and really it's, it's everywhere. It's on all apps. I think Sate would agree. I mean, it's, it's in game rooms. It's on kids gaming. It's everywhere. So it doesn't matter where, you know, it, you are, even if it's say, um, a Disney, uh, app, you still got to be aware. Um, and that's why I talk to, when I talk to parents, I talk about communication. It's really important that we do. And it sounds like you have very open lines of communication so that kids can talk about it, can report it because too many parents, they go into a threat mode where, you know, if, if you do this or if you do this online, I'm taking it all away. I'm taking your phone. I'm taking your computer. And as we know, that doesn't work. Um, so just understanding we've got to have those open lines of communication as well as be aware uh, what all these apps do. Um, Snapchat, Instagram, doesn't matter what it is. Just make sure that if your child has it, that you're aware um, of how it works, of the possibilities of people being on there. Um, and then talking about like online gaming and, and Sate can talk about this more, but having those, those cameras um, in these online game chat rooms are really dangerous as well. But a lot of these conversations are 
my, my thing is when I always talk to parents, I say, if you don't get anything out of what I'm saying, the number one thing we need is communication with our kids. That is number one tool we have because we're handing our kids essentially, I mean, these, these powerful computers and they're walking out the doors with them, with their phones. Um, and so it's really hard as a parent to keep track of everything because they're not always under our thumb. There are a lot of different monitoring ways as well. There's softwares, there's different, you know, phone carriers, things like that. Um, and they do, you know, you can access things like that as well as apps. There are so many apps out there now for parents that help uh, monitor and track and things like that. Um, but could, I, could you send those to us, Michelle? Could you send those to us and we will list them in the yeah. notes for this okay. episode? Because oh, awesome. uh, rather than having you, you know, recite all of them here, I mean, it'd be good. And that way we can uh, have our listeners link to those apps because I know, I know we'd be very interested in that kind of thing. Well, and Michelle, something that you said about the online gaming, and we've, I mean, how many kids? are playing Fortnite with some stranger from who knows where they may see his face on the little, you know, camera thing up there, or they just may hear their voice. And I mean, we've taken away all those things, but how many, I mean, is gaming a source of, uh, I don't even know whether it's a source of, but it doesn't feel right as a mom. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it is. It is, and uh, just to, uh, as I answer that, but to back up a little bit, uh, you, you talk about your daughter and, and how she was approached by whoever this was on, on Instagram. One of these things that uh, these people look for is to isolate a child. And it's, you guys have seen it, it's very easy to isolate a child online. And in this gaming um, aspect that you're talking about, most of the time these kids are probably in their bedroom or in the basement, they got the headset on and they're alone. Playing. Right for hours on end, um, who, know, who knows how long they're playing. And it's very easy. I, I have a case currently right now where um, a little boy was approached by an offender um, or, or by, by someone um, uh, just playing Fortnite. And he, it started back in March and they've been talking ever since then up until his mom found out about it in August. And so already, that grooming um, was was occurring, just like what Michelle said, that grooming was happening throughout that time where this person got the kid's trust or gained the kid's trust. He learned of uh, his interest. And then ultimately, and unfortunately, he started to receive um, what he wanted, pictures from, 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 from this kid. And so these these people who are, who are engaging in these kinds of conversations with our kids, they do their homework. They they know who they're who they're targeting. They know um, exactly what what these kids are interested in, and they they capitalize on that to get what they want. But um, it's isolating them, and and it, like I said, it's very easy to do that uh, online because these kids are by themselves um, on their phone or or in a in a gaming environment. Anyway, these things that we hand our children are very powerful. They're very powerful, but what Michelle and I have seen in the, in the rest of the task force is that comes it comes at a price if parents choose to allow their, their kids um, to have those kinds of uh, devices. It comes at a price. Um, you're opening a whole new world to your children if you choose to give them a, a, a smartphone. But I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Michelle said. Having, having that essential, important conversation dialogues with your children helps to, in, in the case of your guys's daughter she if, if, if she knew that she was talking to someone she shouldn't have been talking to she should feel comfortable coming to you guys and say hey um i don't know who this guy is but he's asking for such and such and he, well the the, the interesting thing, at least in our case, was that she is so innocent. She thought she was playing a game. And in fact, there's evidence through the entire chat thread of her taking on a certain role as, I think, a puppy, a puppy. as yeah. a puppy, 
right? And she th- and the person on the other end was playing right oh, along he with was that. Good. He was, was really good so at that. Good. Yeah. And and right to the point where uh, it started to turn into uh, you know uh, an inappropriate line of of communication, and so and it got to the. <laughs> We were very fortunate in that we were able to discover it because she did not realize up to that point. We don't think that that she was in any kind of trouble at all, or at least into a, a, a difficult place. Well, she place. didn't know enough to even yeah, know she that didn't it know was it, bad. You know, but so. it was awful and frightening. And I'm sure we're not the only people. And and how frightening with the Fortnite thing because. You know, I know, we know that people, I mean, my kids come home and say, well, I won't have friends if they can't come over and play Fortnite. And we've gone electronic free well, with and- all that stuff because we've had this horrific experience, but I hadn't thought about the dangers of of, ga- of, of gaming, gaming and the cameras and, the men- and things. Well, and, and that brings us to another point I wanted to bring up and ask, and that is, I mean, with so much of our world and so much of the academics that the kids are going through in school being online. And I mean, I was just looking at our son Joseph's grades today from, you know, a bunch of different teachers and that's how they communicate, you know, because we are into an internet world now. um, Is it reasonable to, take our children's phones away and computers away and just say, you know what, we're all, we're going straight on paper and the, and we're getting dumb phones and you're not going to, I mean, is that reasonable to do that or, or how do you handle it? Yeah. Well, exactly what you just said. Um, It's really not reasonable if we think about it to keep our kids in a bubble. I mean, we can't, you know, and where the schools are going, online and everything's digital, we have got to give them the education and the tools so they know how to navigate things safely. And that's why these this communication is so important. Because I mean, I I don't think it's reasonable to to hide them away. We have to educate them. Um, and I'll so, show you. So, so if that is indeed the case, and I have no doubt that it is, where does the rubber meet the road on that? When we educate our kids, what does that actually mean? And what are we telling them? Are we putting filters on their devices? Or are we getting apps that help us to monitor as parents? Um, tell me how, what that looks like. Well, I think it's at a parent's discretion, obviously. But you've got all kinds of parents have all kinds of tools at their fingertips with apps, with uh, software, with web resources. And so you can do anything and everything, including like with phone carriers. Um, There's a lot of phone carriers that have different monitoring systems on them. So it can go clear from you have everything where you're monitoring your kids to there's parents that hand them the phone and send them on their way, which isn't a smart thing to do either. Um, so it's all at a parent's discretion. It really is. And depending on how that is handled is how that child will proceed with that. But I think in my opinion, before we're handing them these powerful devices to walk out the door with, we have to know how they work. We have to sit down and talk with them about how they work, especially when we're talking about different ages, you know, it's all age appropriate levels and depending on when, And depending on, did that work? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we still have you. (laughs) Depending on when we're handing them those phones, depending on the age. So some people will go, you know, hand them in kindergarten. Others, they're high school. So it just depends on those, how those conversations will work. Um, Sate, what do you think? um, These kids, they need to understand that if you as a parent give them a phone, it is not their phone you have every right to look through that phone to see what apps are on there and what messages are on there. And they just got to be okay with it. It's not, that's not a good phone. Um, And and I encourage parents to know what is on their kids' phones. I, they should know the passcodes to their phone, to those, to their kids' phones, if there's a passcode set. And then of course there, there should be rules about that phone, turning it in at the end of the night, um, 
uh, uh, no no text no texting or phone calls during school whatever the rules are I mean just like what Michelle said it's at the parents discretion but these kids should know that the that the phone or whatever the device is it's not theirs it's it's the parents yeah all these apps that there, there's a ton of apps out there that can help monitor um, what's going on on the phones these phone companies can even um, help um, set limits on on the phones all of that all of that is great but it comes down to the communication between the child and, and their parent. Uh, there's a re- those those apps. Um, it's easy to to break them. That's why there's updates every every quarter or every month. We all we all we all get that some sort of update on your iPhone or on or on your Android. Uh, there's a reason for that because that it, it gets outdated super fast, um, and so it, it's easy to break those. But I think it just comes down to the communication. Well, one of the frightening things that uh, in doing a little bit of research before we started this episode was the information hiding apps that the kids can put on their phone. I mean, make it look like a calculator. And actually, that's not what it is at all. Um, how, how do you combat that as a parent? <laughs> It, you know, I, I look at these things and that's why I always tell parents, especially when we're talking about really young ages to like Sete said, having them turn in their phones every night, looking what's on there. I mean, obviously if there's two calculator apps, you know, that suspicious, something one of them, <laughs> right. And there are so many now that are vaults and different things that hold videos and that hold other apps that hold images, whatever it may be. I mean, there's a million of them. And just keeping up, it's really hard as parents to keep up on all those. But clicking on them, making sure that's really what it is, as simple as that. If they're turning in these phones, making sure it is what it is. Um, yeah, no, I mean, just, gosh, there, there are... There, <laughs> Just like what Michelle said, there are so many apps out there that that can hide content, and even within these apps, you can hide content. Uh, one of one of the one of the selling points for Snapchat is that it goes away in, uh, within what twenty four hours or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, we all know that it doesn't go away. Um, online activity it doesn't go away. It's out there for the world. It's called the World Wide Web for some for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and what. What we what we found in, in Snapchat, there's a feature in there called the, the My Eyes Only. The My Eyes Only feature in Snapchat is pretty much a hidden folder. And if you set a passcode to that, uh, to that My Eyes Only, no one could get into that. Not even Snapchat or me as a law enforcement officer because it's encrypted. Um, and you have to have that passcode. And that is, what we find is that's very sensitive photos and videos and messages that are that are that are in that in that folder. But I, I would say um, if, 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 uh, if your child has, a, ha- has one of these devices that you know exactly what apps are on there and that if they, if they want to put a new app on there, that it goes through the approval process uh, with, with a parent to, to get an app on there. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys, what is behind this? Is it the bad guy out there? Is it the kids just get sucked into it. I mean, wh- why? I guess maybe it's my why are simple, we facing what? Why, we're yeah, facing? is that the bad guy coming after the kids? Is the kids getting sucked in? The kids want this erotic material, or if it isn't even that? I mean, wh- why is what's just the, addicted to yeah, the whole digital what is thing this behind all of this? There, there's that's a that's a that's a loaded question to be honest, and, and there's so many answers to um, to that. Uh, that type of question, but here's what I can here's what I can can tell you from what I've seen is children they're they're teens and they, they're curious right and on on these platforms what is something that kids or teens often search for it is something of affirmation uh, they 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 want the likes they want those little hearts on their on their picture and. And that means something to to kids, and for those who are seeking to exploit these kids, they know that, and they oftentimes we find for those who are who are looking to get this kind of content, they they offer some sort of incentive for these kids, and and they'll pay them through Venmo or Cash App oh. or Zelle, mm-hmm. um, and 
and you guys will you guys will be shocked that kids are just willy nilly just they just give it because they want they want the money they want the they want the likes or what whatever it is if they're not getting attention from home they're gonna seek it somewhere else. Um, yeah. that, that's just that's just what we've yeah. what I've what I've seen. Well, and I think uh, just like Sete said in the beginning, instant gratification. That's what this world is now. It's instant. And that's like when he was talking about the likes and the hearts on pictures, that is their social status. That is so important to kids. And it's crazy how much that impacts their life. And like he said, these guys know that. Predators know that. Um, and they are victimizing these kids by using that against them. One of the things that is so frightening is that you're dealing with a set of uh, human beings whose brains have not fully developed yet. And so, I mean, the whole idea of social acceptance and, and the likes and uh, the hearts and that kind of thing, is, it seems to be far more uh, important to them than it would be to us adults, you know, in the room. And, and so because these kids' brains are not yet fully developed, do we run the risk of, uh, of having them, having their intellectual and emotional uh, maturity stunted because of their interactions and because of just the, the nature of the Internet and the gaming and all of that? Are we running that risk from where you sit? I'd say absolutely. I, I would agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at the emotional, just the emotional toll that these things take on these kids. Um, say sex extortion cases, um, which Sate has had a lot of them. We've had a lot of them lately, especially with COVID, where they're trying to get videos and images and they're threatening them. Um, that takes a huge emotional toll on these kids. And it's taken it so far as we've seen, you know, teen suicide increase and you know, you know, social media has a great play in that. No, no I don't. We, social media has has a huge impact on on suicide threats and unfortunately suicide. So, yeah. 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 Um, do you guys I mean, you don't need me to tell you, you don't need to tell me your family makeup, but do you have children or younger teenage children or younger adolescents that you are personally having an impact on their life. What do you do? I mean, I always ask the doctor, if this was your child, what would you do? do? What do you guys do? What do you counsel? What do you do? Right. So I have, I have three kids, um, ages five, three and eight months. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily in this, uh, in this world yet, but I, I mean, nonetheless, I understand it. Um, but for me, it, it, with, in dealing with electronics, my kids are huge fans of YouTube kids. They, they love that app. Um, and my, my, my wife, she's not a huge fan of that app because it's so addicting to my kids. Um, but nonetheless, we, we, do, we do monitor and set limits of how long they're on, they're on the iPad to, to watch YouTube kids. And that's, the, that's kind of the extent that we have with, with our Personally, children. yeah. Electronics. Um, I have, well, she's now 19, but <laughs> so she's congratulations. She's made it to adulthood. <laughs> That's congratulations. <laughs> you survived. <laughs> right. But this started with, with us. Um, she got a phone when she went into junior high. So it was about eighth grade. Um, and things were just kind of be starting to be popular, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, all that. So she went into ninth grade. She went into high school at 15 and that is when yeah she got snapchat and things started to increase on social media and i'll tell you it has been a crazy um five years of that social media played a huge impact in her life um even though i've been doing this so i've been um here for nine years doing this so even before uh she was you know influenced by it but we've had these conversations over and over and over and over and over again and she'll t she would tell me mom I already know this I know but you're going to know it again and you're going to know it again these are continuing conversations and I definitely went through my phone carrier and was able to um only so many messages 
you can only be on the internet certain times of the day. I could definitely access that. And I could definitely monitor that, okay. which I did clear through high school, her senior year. I still turned the phone off at night because they're not going to turn it off themselves and they need to do homework and they need to get sleep and they need to not be impacted by what's happening on Snapchat 24 hours a day, which they would if we didn't unplug them. So that is what I did personally. Um, I, I did that clear through when she was a senior in high school. How, how did that affect your relationship with her? What, did it put a strain on it that would not have been there otherwise? Or did that even matter to you? Maybe it was safer. <laughs> you know, at times, did it anger her? Um, yes, definitely. Um, but it wasn't so much that it, you know, destroyed our relationship. She understood why I was doing what I was doing. And I also wasn't the mother that that said, oh, you're not going to have Snapchat because most people would think in our line of work, that's what we do, but we yeah. don't. Instead, I had conversations about it. And she definitely, when she got her phone, she had a couple of people that were trying to connect with her online and that were using phishing scams with the texting. And she came to me because she we had talked about it. She knew what to do. She knew how to handle that. Wow. And that, I think, is what makes the impact for our kids. And that's why I say, you know, yeah, they can't live in a bubble. We have to educate them. Even doing what we do, you know, we still let them have these things, but we educate them so that they can go through life and understand it. Because these things are going to happen regardless. Yeah. Well, and if you um, go ahead. I'm sorry, man. Uh, but just like what you said, Bob, you you, you talked about uh, our, our children, their brains aren't fully developed. The kids are, are curious. And if, if, if something that is hot and that is the latest, um, and they know it is, and, and they're not getting it or getting approval from the parents, they're going to they're gonna go out and seek it anyway, because they're, they're, just, they're just curious. They're just going to. And so I, I agree with Michelle. It's um, I think we would be doing a disservice to our children if we, if we keep them in that bubble. So, so here we are now in a situation where we've got this tremendous tool. I, I guess you could equate it to fire in that you can use it to warm yourself and to warm people around you, or you can get burned by it and have it maybe even kill you. So here we have this fire we call the internet, and we have these children who are who start as little infants, and then I mean you have today. Your... I was out exercising. There was this little baby, probably one, with an iPad propped up. I thought in the stroller. And, yeah, I mean they could have been looking around, but I mean you know we raise them, we give them to them like here, have this, be raised on it, and then all of a sudden the danger starts you know, coming in. Right. So here, here we are. And, and we, we've talked about how their brains have not developed yet and how we need to keep a, a, a good line of communication open. Let's go back upstream just a little bit further and, and have you talk to us because I know both of you have without question thought about this. And that is, how do you create an atmosphere in your home where Communication is open, regardless of their age and how far into adolescence they've gotten. And how do you create such an environment where you're able to make these tools available to them, but you help that that they don't wind up whacking themselves on the thumb with that hammer or burning themselves with that with that fire? How do you create that atmosphere in your homes? Well, I, I think that, um, sorry, no, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> so, Dave, will you start, please? <laughs> I, I don't mean I cut the show. Um, but um, uh, well, b because I have babies, pretty much, um, it, it, it starts, for, for me and my wife, we, we've had this, this, this discussion because of my line of work um, about our children. Because with, with our kids being so young, um, I think, I think, those essential conversations happen now uh, with, with my oldest being five. Um, I'm not gonna hide, um, I'm not gonna hide this from them. 
Uh, they're they're going to grow up. My son is going to grow up. He's going to get into elementary, middle school, high school. He's going to know. Um, he's going to want a cell phone because other kids are going to be are going to have it, and he, he's going to want that joy or or that excitement as as well. I I will have that open communication with my kids about the dangers of of having a cell phone, the apps that are out there. And he, he will know because I'm in this line of work the, what, what dangers these, these apps pose. But then he will also know how good these devices are. It's not just all bad. Unfortunately, me and Michelle see a lot of bad, but there's a lot of good that, that comes from these. But educating my kids on the dangers and helping and just kind of guiding them in a way that if they do encounter this, this is what you need to do. If you do get this kind of message, this is what you need to do. Come tell daddy or come tell mommy. Um, but instilling that trust in them that they can just come to, to mom or dad, right? Um, they are going to encounter this. There's no if, ends, or buts about it. There's, I think us as parents, we just need to accept that. This is the world that we live in. They're going to encounter this. Educating them on how to deal with it when they do encounter, um, encounter it is, is important to me. Yeah, and same here. Um, ever since my daughter's been old enough, when we handed her the phone, I've always been that I've never hidden anything. I'm very, very open about everything um, and not making them feel like they're doing something bad um, if they are approached. Letting her know, I've always let her know, you can talk to me about anything. I don't want you to feel bad about anything. Please come to mom, come to dad. Um, that's just how we are. We've never hidden anything from her and unfortunately I think a lot of people do that because they kind of want to bury their head in the sand and think that it doesn't happen but then we're doing such a disservice to our kids because like Sete said it's not if it's going to happen it's when and so when it does they don't have those tools they don't know what to do with it and they they have a fear of getting in trouble and yeah. so having that so they don't fear that you know they're going to get in trouble that they can always go to a trusted adult whether it be a teacher or their parents or whoever whoever it is um, a trusted adult when they have something like this um, I think it's just so important not to have that fear put in them and let them know that they can come to you for anything and everything not 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 you know, covering up anything. Right. Like That's that. perfect guidance. So you guys are doing this day in, day in, you know, day in, day out. I mean, some of the things our daughter saw, it was so vulgar and filthy. Bob wouldn't even read it out loud to me or let her hear it again, whether she understood it or not. How do you guys keep yourselves mentally safe through all this? I mean, how do you keep it from not affecting you or does it? I mean, Right. So, I mean, uh, like I was saying, I, I've been I've been in this line of work for, for about 12 years. And just like you mentioned at the beginning, I, I've been a part of SVU, part of SWAT patrol. I did all those assignments, I, but none of those touch ICAC. ICAC is probably is the most um, fulfilling assignment I have ever had. Um, you talk about distractions and how do I keep myself sane because of what I because of what I'm exposed to. It's 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 hard. It's hard watching those videos. It's hard looking at those images, especially when it's around the ages of my own children. Yeah. It's hard. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm human. Mm -hmm. And it gets to me, it gets to me. Sometimes I'm gonna, I, I have to get out of my office and just go walk around. Um, but for me, at least, um, I, I take a lot of my frustration out, a lot of my, um, a lot of the stress that comes with this job. I take it out on weights. I, 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 I go to the gym. I have I am a I am a spiritual person, and so I do the spiritual thing as well. Um, but one of the things that that really helps me um, overcome all this is therapy. I do go to therapy for this. And mm -hmm. if you're a part of ICAC, um, especially here at the AG's office, you are you're mandated to to go to therapy once a month. Oh and, wow! And all the investigators who are a part of ICAC throughout the state have this same option. We 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 hope we um, and our commander can tell you this, but we hope to roll this out with with PDs, but all those who are just affiliated with law enforcement. But for now, those who are involved in invest investigating uh, exploitation and, and uh, child trafficking, um, you uh, we we do go to a therapy to to 
uh, to deal with this because it's hard. You got, as you guys can imagine, it's hard. And I can tell you that it is, that it's hard. And so that's, that's what works for me. That's how, that's what drives me to, to, to keep coming back. Um, uh, is because I have those distractions. I have those outside influences that help me come back and, and, and accomplish the mission, the goal of ICAC, which is it's to save children. And how can you can't, you can't argue that. So, yeah. Yeah. Michelle, how do you handle it? Um, you know, kind of the same. Uh, I do the therapy that we're mandated to do, which is a great resource for us. Um, yoga, exercise, um, and travel. I love to travel. I love the water. Um, so that kind of thing, uh, just being with my family, um, is a huge, a huge influence for me. And like, like, a, like Sete said, it is, I mean, when we save a child and we actually have a, a live victim that we can save, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And just even that right there is why we all do what we do. Wow. Yeah. Thank you both so much for your personal sacrifices because as parents, we're very limited in what we can do. And obviously there are a lot of things that we don't even know that should be done that could be done, but you've been a great resource, but as you know, your families also realize that it's taking a personal toll on you. So thank you from all of us who have children, who have potential children, who have had children for the sacrifice and work that you do to keep people safe. Truly you are guardians you know, truly guardians of our children out there in the world and in society. And we can't thank you enough for all that you do to, to protect them and to go after those folks that would victimize them over and over and over and over and over again. So thank you so much. Our guests uh, today on the podcast have been Michelle Bush Upwall, an education specialist with the Utah Attorney General's Office, and Sete Aulai, a special agent with the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force in the Utah Attorney General's Office. For more information on how to protect children, uh, is the, I know you have a website. What would it be? And we'll put it in the notes in this podcast. It's agutah.gov. Okay. And then I will send you um, a lot of resources for apps, websites, for all of your listeners. Oh, perfect. Super. Perfect. Because Super. I know that, you know, we start having questions, but the more we learn, the more questions we have. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, Thank I can also give you uh, my contact information as well, so okay. that if anybody had questions, they can certainly contact us for presentations or resources or whatever it may be. All right. And, and just as a note for your listeners, um, ICAC is not only a na- not only a statewide agent or a task force, but is it's a nationwide task force. Nation. Yeah. Our reach in our state, our reach is. From Tremont down to St. George, um, so it's we're, we're just not, we're not just limited to here in the, on the Wasatch Front. If your listeners have have concerns or have questions for us, and they're they're in, they're in Logan or in Blanding, it's okay to reach out because we're down there too. We we have affiliate agencies in all those areas, including rural Utah, that that we can. Um, definitely reach out and, and ask for those those questions. Right, and and ICAC is a nationwide program. I know th- it's present in what all fifty states. Is that correct? So, if someone does have a concern, um, issues, where would they look if they're not in Utah? A lot of our listeners are outside of the state. Where would they go for help? If, 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 sorry. Oh no. No, if they have if they have questions, it's ICAC taskforce.org is it dot org or dot com dot org dot org and another great place is the national center for missing and exploited children um, because that's where we get our cyber tips from that people report to or, um, or companies companies report to and anybody can report on that as we, well we work we work on a daily basis with google with facebook with Twitter, we, it's, on, it's a daily basis that we work with those with those companies who, who report these um, these crimes to us. Wonderful. Wow, you guys are awesome. Thank yeah. you so very much for all you do. A whole new world opening yeah. up of 
people saving, helping save children. So thank you. Michelle and Sete, thanks so much for being with us. And thank you, our listeners, for uh, tuning into this, pos- this episode of the podcast. This is The Evans Life, a remarkable adventure. <laughs>